One of the ways in which people read Dante's Divine Comedy is vertically. So the idea is that there are corresponding moments and perceptions, experiences in Inferno, in Purgatorio, in Paradiso. And it's very fascinating to look at how those perceptions change in the three domains, because then you get a sense of how Dante's perception itself unfolds and also it gives us a sense of where we are on the comparable journey in our own spiritual lives. You can read the Divine Comedy almost as a gauge as well as a guide through the journey towards divine perception. And so Here's considering half a dozen or so ways in which the journey unfolds from the complete alienation of Inferno through the transformational regions of Purgatory to the deepening unfolding of the unity with the divine that Dante uncovers, discovers, realises was always the case all along in the Paradiso thinking about how these things change in relation to our experience of time, our experience of love, our experience of what it's like to actually seek, what it's like to suffer too, because that changes very dramatically, how the experience of telepathy unfolds through the Inferno, Purgatorio and Paradiso, and then also thinking about the transhumanising of Dante's soul, the word that he coins and captures the journey towards God as well. So think first of all about how the experience of time shifts. Basically what happens is that in the Inferno the souls are preoccupied with the past and the future and that traps them because they don't have what the souls in Purgatory discover which is a sense of the present. And then that leads in the Paradiso to the ability freely to move across time, to be if in eternity. So consider three moments in the three canticles that Dante uses to explore this experience of time. First of all, an encounter which he has in the circle of the gluttonous in the Inferno, where he meets a character called Kako. And Kako is lying in the mud, unable to take him what's good, so lying in filth, and talks to Dante about Florence, which he also knew, but particularly about the terrible things in Florence's past and the dre dreadful things which are going to happen in Florence's future, which Dante himself is going to have to experience. So it's Kako mocking Dante by playing on Dante's fears for the future as well as terrors from the past. And so Kako projects his own locked-in relationship to time to Dante and creates a sense of terror and horror because he too is preoccupied with the past, anxious about the future, and so is unable to move, literally get stuck in the mud. But what's fascinating too is there is a, just a moment at the end of Kako's diatribe against Dante where Dante the poet describes him squinting. It's as if he suddenly, momentarily, but only fleetingly, realises that there's a present here. And that presence has actually brought Dante to him, which is why he can do the mocking. But Kako's unable to hold on to that present. And so after squinting at Dante, wondering, is something new happening here? Am I seeing something in the present? He's unable to hold on to it, and so he falls back into the mud, still trapped. The present, though, shows up for those souls who are in the purgatorial state, and it's why they spend time in purgatory, because in the present they can work on themselves, understand how they are able to convert their vices into virtues that enable them to share more and more with divine life. And that can only happen in the present, because present change only happens in the present. 
and it's shown particularly with the character that Dante meets called Statius. Now we know that Statius has spent 500 years on Mount Purgatory in the present transforming and he meets Dante and Virgil because he has completed his time on purgatory his transformation is complete and so he's able to move with Dante and Virgil from the experience of the timed present towards the timelessness of eternity and that happens when they enter the paradise and think particularly about right at the end of the paradise where Dante's ability to move across time in eternity is fluent and in the white rose one of Dante's images for the Empyrean, the highest of the high heavens, Dante sees all sorts of characters from the Virgin Mary to Eve, the first woman, and so sees all souls stretched out across history as they're known in timed reality but now here in eternity he's able to move effortlessly amongst them he can traverse towards them but that's not really traversing because there's no distance it's all about relationship he can move through time but it's not really moving across history it's being present to everything eternally because again time is just another way that we on earth measure relationship and when we know our relationships to be one in the divine life that is what it is to move from time to reality into eternity and so that seamless diaphanous effortless timeless ability to be with all things and therefore with the one all is the experience of time transformed in the paradise so from preoccupation with past and future that terrorises in the inferno through stepping into the present in the purgatory that enables change to the free movement across eternity in the paradise. Think about how this kind of way of looking at Dante affects the experience of love. In the inferno Dante meets Francesca and Paolo who are caught up in whirlwinds of love, locked in the desperation for love to deliver satisfaction to them. They were lovers on earth and they're lovers forever in eternity, except that this is an infernal experience of love because it's love as possessive. It's being in love with love. It's becoming desperate with the sense that love must be all you need. And so instead of freeing you, you lock the object of your love to yourself and so Francesca and Paolo are locked together in the inferno unable seemingly to escape from this love of love it's the kind of dream that there's a perfect person out there for you and if only you find them all your problems will be solved well the great risk is that you don't find this other person or if you do they don't actually end up solving your problems and even when you are together close the world down rather than open it up. Love changes though for Dante in the purgatory when he is experiencing the present and in particular on the first night of purgatory he has a dream and in his dream he experiences his inner love as as rape, as possessiveness, as abduction he dreams of Jupiter abducting the beautiful youth Ganymede to take Ganymede to Mount Olympus and have him there. And Dante wakes distraught that this is the sense of love which is operative in his psyche, being revealed to him by his dark dream. And yet he's in the present and so can work on it. And Virgil explains to him that during the dream, actually what was happened was that Lucy, St Lucia, one of the women in heaven who's particularly looking out for Dante, had appeared and carried him further up the mountain. This is what love can do. It can give itself rather than grab for itself. It can help us rise rather than drag us into the places we don't want to go. And so 
whilst there's an inner aspect of Dante's love, it can be transformed because it's present in Virgil's description of Lucy carrying Dante up the mountain and so can unravel from the possessiveness to the freedom that love can bring and so enable Dante to continue on his journey, which brings to the completeness of love in the heavens. And I think you particularly see this in the angels that unfold around them as Dante is able to love reality in the sense of knowing it. It's resonating now with his person. It's not revealing his lack anymore, but his ability to take in more and more and more fullness. And this is what the angels know of love. They see the divine unalloyed and in their love can completely take in that divine presence and so transmit it into creation. The angels are the active presences of God throughout all realms and they are able to seamlessly bring the divine light and love and life and intelligence to all realms because their love fills and overflows, fills and overflows in a continual transmission and movement. This is what love can be. So very different from the possessiveness of Francesco and Paolo in the Inferno, worked through by Dante as he rises up through the purgatory and realises the dark side of his love, which he can then let go to allow the light of love in, which is experienced when they see the angels. Now this way of reading things can be applied to the business of seeking itself from alienation through transformation to unity. Seeking itself takes on different forms, has different qualities of experience in the Inferno, Purgatorio and Paradiso. When, for example, in the Inferno, Dante and Virgil come to the city of Dis, they're blocked by the great gates of Dis, this castle in hell, mocked and terrorised by demons and gorgons and medusas that appear on the turrets. And Virgil treats this moment as a puzzle. He must find the right words to open the gate of Dis, he thinks. He must get the right magical formula in order that it can be sprung before them. And this is a kind of infernal reading of what it can be like to seek the divine in one way. It treats spiritual transformation as if it were a puzzle, as if it were magic, as if there were a code, as if only you could get the right formula, it would suddenly open up for you like the gates of Dis. It doesn't work for Virgil and an angel has to appear to do the work for them. But where seeking changes and becomes genuinely transformative is in purgatory. And now seeking is actually an inward term. It's to understand yourself in all the corners, the crevices, the turns. So rather than trying to change the world, like opening the gates of Dis, this purgatorial seeking works on oneself, not so much to change oneself, but to discover the deeper truths about oneself by seeing through the mist by unravelling the ignorance, by letting go to let more in. This is what seeking is like in purgatory. You've got to understand yourself in order to see what is more than yourself and then to let go of those parts of your narrow self that have held you back to reveal the wider aspects of yourself that connect to all things. Seeking has a very, very different feel. There's always hope in purgatory, even when there's struggling and suffering. And that is what purgatorial seeking is like. Very interestingly, seeking continues in the heavens, in paradise for Dante. But it's got such a different quality again. Because this is seeking as a kind of celebration. It's like seeing something new and going... That's tremendous as well, seeing something you hadn't quite fully perceived and saying, that's more wonder. It's a rational celebration too. It's about understanding and so 
a kind of celebration that rings throughout you, the soul seeking, discovering, expanding, and so rings with all the souls and reality around as well. It's the seeking that elicits praise, that elicits delight, that knows more and more joy, as Dante shares with the souls around him as he speaks about beautiful things, such as faith, hope and love, as his sight deepens and so he's able to take in more and more of the divine light. Seeking looks very different in the paradise. It's moved from being regarded as a kind of puzzle, a confusion in hell, to an inward transformation in the purgatory based on knowing oneself, into this celebration of life itself that opens more and more and more to the all seeking in paradise. Now suffering too is experienced very very differently in the different realms. Thinking about suffering now, having thought about time, how that changes, love, how that changes, seeking, how that changes. Thinking now about suffering and how that changes. In the inferno, suffering is, as you might expect, it is relentless, it is terrible, it is merciless, it is horrible. And when Dante, just inside the walls of Dis, bumps into a character called Farinata, that is played out because Farinata, caught in his own suffering, taunts and is nasty towards Dante, who instantly starts getting drawn into the nastiness as well. He has to know this experience of suffering in order to travel through the inferno because it's as much an inner journey as it is anything else. He must resonate with reality to know reality and so to know and have revealed to him the nature of this kind of suffering, he must experience it. It's part of the difficult meaning of suffering. But it changes and in the purgatory, suffering still exists but it's always supported and contained and held within the light of hope. Um, there's darkness, but there's always the sun returning in the morning. And Dante himself experiences this no more keenly than when, on the last terrace of Mount Purgatory, he's confronted by the flames that he must enter in order to complete the transformation of himself, to, as it were, burn away all the dross, and so enable him to carry the gold of divine life but it's still painful and he still fears entering the flames he says that he would rather have stepped into molten glass than to have entered these flames and yet he does supported by Virgil and the others around him another key way in which suffering is transformed is when you know that you are known in the difficulty by those around you you're not alone anymore and that knowing is both a comfort but also a foretaste of the expansion of awareness that is on the other side of the suffering. And so suffering, as the saints will say, becomes sweet. It almost becomes desired because it's experienced as the transformative process through which more and more is known. And then in the paradise, suffering continues as well. But now it's hardly goes by the name of suffering because it's so associated with this growing expansive awareness of more and more things. But just consider the moment when Dante meets his great-great-grandfather Cassio Guida in the heaven of Mars. And here Cassio Guida says to Dante that you will have to face the exile from Florence when you return to earth which is going to last for 20 years or more the last years of your life a long time and Dante embraces this fact now he doesn't resist it but what he does do is go into a kind of weighing up of the experience he thinks about how there'll be good times in exile as well as bad he'll find hospitality as well as be thrown out um, he'll find patrons as well as have to face the dust of the road and what's so interesting about this is that Cassio Guida stops Dante from doing this weighing up of the good and the bad, um, as if the good of pleasurable experience can be outweighed by the bad of suffering experience. It says, no, there's a third position 
to know about this difficulty you will face, which is to be grounded in the divine reality that can say yes to all things, that can welcome whatever happens because it can tip you back into the ground that holds all things. All experience can be befriended because it reminds you that experience is just a manifestation of the divine life. And so even difficult experience can be thought of as a greater revelation of the divine love. Understand this ground and then what happens when you enter exile, Cassia Grida says, will not only be able to be accepted but be able to be experienced as the continual unfolding of the divine reality which is closer to you than anything that's happening as well as transcending all that's happening. In traditional Christian language this is God knowing of suffering but not being changed by the suffering. Um, God's immutability as it's said. Um, the parallel experience I think which say the parent might have with the child or the therapist with the client where they understand fully the nature of what's being undergone but hold on to the experience that it's transformative because the suffering can be contained. God's answer to the problem of suffering at least in one aspect here for all suffering is difficult but it can change. Be sure that suffering can change. This is what the sufferers tell us. It can be merciless, nasty, relentless. It can become an experience of pain that is known to lead to others and to the all. And then it can rest in the divine reality and so be contained and even befriended because it is an intimation of what grows within us as the divine presence. Here's a fifth quality experience that changes as Dante moves through these realms. The experience of telepathy. Now this is fascinating because it's quite a feature of the Divine Comedy but perhaps less talked about today. And in the Inferno the souls don't know about telepathy. They're locked into themselves. They are preoccupied with their own experiences, their own regrets, their own vengeances, um, and so they don't know of other minds. Caponeus, who Dante and Virgil meet, is a good example of this. He's one of the blasphemers on the hot sands, cursing God, and it's such a pathetic sight because he doesn't even realise that his own curses are what's causing him the pain. He's so locked in that he thinks he is God and so is ignorant even of Dante and Virgil passing as they look on this pathetic figure. But telepathy starts to unfold in the purgatory. And you particularly see this in the way that souls talk about prayer. Um, the figure of Lapia appears to them in purgatory and she knows that prayer is about connecting to others because she asks Dante for his prayers as she's transforming in purgatory but also offers to pray for him. There's the beginning of an exchange here going on, um, a movement. The gift of life is being offered, received, reciprocated, given, taken. There's a dynamic here unfolding that is a key anticipation of the full capacity to know what's going on with everybody around you that Dante and Beatrice know in the per paradise. And here in paradise, Dante is completely transparent to Beatrice because not just these are two minds meeting as their eyes often look at each other, but Beatrice explains it's because actually her mind is now transparent to the divine mind and through that sharing of the one, the other minds around her show themselves to her in her mind. And so there's a triangulated explanation of telepathy here. It's not just 
transmission like from one telephone to another. It's actually a sharing in the whole of reality that then reveals things to her about Dante and what he's thinking, feeling, wanting to ask, and so on. A very interesting, I think, account of telepathy. It's not the locked in regarding yourself as encased within a bone skull and even perhaps doubting whether others are alive in a thinking, active conscience sense at all. It begins to open up with the activity of prayer in purgatory, which makes the assumption that minds are transparent to God and so begins to practice, reveal how they're transparent to each other as well, that's then fully known in the paradise because then the mind of the soul is increasingly one with the mind of God and that reveals information, feelings, a sense of things that's going on around in the full experience of telep telepathic transparency. Finally, come to the business of transhumanizing. In a way, the experience of time, the experience of love, the experience of seeking, suffering, telepathy are all aspects of this transhumanizing that Dante reveals to us, having had it revealed to him in his journey through the inferno and its alienation, the purgatory and its transformation to the paradise and its unity. Step back though to the inferno just for the untranshumanizing figure of Brunetto Latini, who Dante meets in the inferno. And Brunetto is so fascinating because he taught Dante its thought and did reveal truths to Dante, particularly about poetry and about glory and about celebrating beauty and love in life. But Brunetto has got confused about these things because he focused on sustaining himself through the celebration of love and beauty and glory. He didn't transhumanize in fact because he wanted to know these things but in order to protect him from what he saw as the vicissitudes of time and how he would be forgotten, how his fame needed to be propped up by him. He sought his own eternity and so lost eternity. And in a way that's quite like the way that transhumanizing is used today by the visionaries of Silicon Valley who want to sustain themselves indefinitely into immortality through the use of silicon chips rather than through the use of poetic verse like Brunetto Latini. But nonetheless, they've got confused that transhumanizing is about sustaining their own life rather than giving into the life that is the source of their life and is the one life anyway. And Brunetto is struggling to appreciate that. Even though he's communicated some truths to Dante, he tells Dante at one point to follow his star, which is not bad advice because, of course, the light of the stars leads Dante into paradise. But he can't quite grasp what that means and so is trying to sustain his own stellar light within a subtle but common confusion in the modern world, you know, where enlightenment means my own understanding rather than opening onto all understanding, where transformation means the extension of my physical life rather than seeing that the spiritual, soulful, divine life is resonant within mortal life. Things start to change for Dante. He starts to become more capable of genuine transhumanizing before Beatrice in the purgatory, where she shows him who he really is. And it's a painful experience for Dante. Um, he must embrace all that he is in order to see how his failures actually are the seeds of his expansion. And so this is the know thyself that can be very hard. And we prefer to know ourselves as we would like to see ourselves and to cut ourselves off from the aspects of ourselves that we don't want to know. But Beatrice tells Dante, no, transhumanizing requires seeing who you are in your all, because that is what's necessary to see the all that is 
in all things. If you can't look at parts of yourself, how are you going to be able to look at parts of reality? And so in the paradise, the transhumanizing of Dante can unfold, not just unimpeded, but in increasingly expansive ways. And he captures a glimpse of the divine. Knowing who he is, he can see who the divine I am is as well. At first, just as an infinitesimally small but brilliant point of light that he sees first in Beatrice's eyes and then can look at himself and taking that infinite light, realising how by taking it in it resonates with the infinite light that's actually within him, the uncreated within him and so that uncreated within him can grow and grow and become more and more one with the uncreated source and wellspring of life. That's the dynamic of transhumanising that he sees now and he captures it in a number of beautiful images in the final parts of the paradise. He says that it's a bit like being an image and as the image becomes more and more perfect, as it completes, as it captures more and more aspects of the source, becomes capable of resonating more and more with its origin. So the difference between the image and the origin starts to collapse and instead it's just one more and more beautiful reflection of reality. The image transhumanizes into its source, which was always its origin anyway. There's another aspect of this, which is like a kind of emptying out in the transhumanizing process. Our life can become more and more a potential space that can then actualize with the divine life. It's why there's this one-two step often described in spiritual practices where at first you step away from what you think you know in order that space can be created so that what is true about what you thought you knew can come in to the space that has unfolded. Um, this is another aspect of transhumanizing. Um, it's the dying to yourself in order to be born to your true self. It's the letting go of what you've held on to in order that those proxies can be transformed into the reality which was always there. And so finally, Dante realises that this transhumanizing unfolding through the paradise is leading to the vision, the experience, the complete unity of moving with the love that moves the sun and the other stars in the final tremendous, silent, perfect image that he leaves us with in the paradise. The wonderful goal that is both an encouragement but is also a promise that when we embrace the transformation that he underwent himself communicates to us and so initiates within us we can understand him not just as a guide but the divine comedy itself as a gauge how we can check our experience of time is it preoccupation with the past and future is it knowing the present that unfolds into eternity we can check our experience of love are we inclined to grasp it hoping that it delivers all or can we know love as a letting go that can embrace the darkness and so become a vehicle that carries us into the regions where intelligence dances in the light of love like the angels are seeking to transforms from one of puzzlement seeking the right formula a magic spell that's going to unlock things to turning inwards knowing ourselves transforming and then then in the paradisal form of seeking it just becomes a celebration a praise a continual expansion of delight suffering too does this change from the nasty merciless horrible experience of suffering through one that because it senses the presence of others around that understand leads to through the pain with hope 
to a wider presence that the suffering fosters and then knowing the experience still of wanting more in paradise but now the wanting known as a grounding so that everything can be held and contained as Dante realises when he accepts his exile not as a weighing up of what will be good about it and what will be bad about it but as part of the paradise that unweights him telepathy too changing locked in in inferno no telepathy there gradually an unfolding of minds no doubt in this life that would be accompanied not just by prayer but by synchronicities by perceptions of things um, an awareness that seems to come from without not just from within us and then in the paradise telepathy is complete because the divine mind is known as holding us we're moving across the face of god continually where waves on the ocean of reality and currents will come into our minds um, as a telepathic experience in this paradisal state and all of this is part of the transhumanizing that Dante shows us not like the transhumanizing of today which is focused on self-sustaining keeping the glory the eternity to oneself by using technology in the fantasy that we can go on forever. Who wants to go on forever in that way? No, Dante tells us. This is about seeing who we are. And transhumanizing is about realizing that our humanity is capable of more than we ever dreamt possible. And so in seeing that, Dante is able to move into the paradise and embrace the divine love, the divine intelligence, the divine love, which he sees was always his intelligence, his love, his light.